So good morning, everybody. I know we're going to have a few people coming in, uh, but I wanted to get started on time. We're going to uh, spend about an hour and a half today talking about uh, the Gavi Alliance. Uh, we have a great panel today that's going to help understand where Gavi is and uh, in particular how it's going to make its pitch to the U.S. as it seeks uh, another three-year replenishment uh, this fall. Five years. Five years, sorry. Uh, so it's going to be a very <laughs> exciting time for us to hear uh, where Gavi is, uh, how the U.S. is going to respond, um, and some of the questions that we think uh, Gabby is going to face in the U.S. audience. Well, we're hoping to hear from you, and we're going to move to questions and answers with you shortly, is your thoughts around where Gabby is with respect to support in the U.S., what are the critical questions you see them needing to answer here, uh, what guidance do you have for Seth and his colleagues around <laughs> how to maximize their uh, sellability to uh, the United States uh, government as a major uh, donor. So we have, uh, of course, our star is Dr. Seth Berkeley, the CEO of Gavi <laughs> Alliance. Uh, he's been there now for about a three year. Years. And three years? <laughs> Jeez, I'm getting old. Uh, and before that, 15 years as the CEO at IAVI, the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative, uh, where I met him, and before that at the Rockefeller Foundation, where he helped to set up IAVI. Uh, uh, we also have with us uh, Dr. Robert Clay, who's the Deputy Assistant Administrator at USAID for Health. Uh, thank you very much for coming. He's the alternate board member on the Gavi board. Um, we have Nicole Bates, who leads the Gates Foundation's work on child health, including polio and immunization, a couple low uh, priority <laughs> targets for the Gates Foundation. Um, and of course, Catherine Bliss uh, from CSIS, uh, who just authored a paper that's outside on uh, Gavi and some of the challenges it might face as it seeks uh, its replenishment efforts, particularly here in the U.S. So the format for today, we're going to uh, give uh, Seth about 10 minutes um, to offer some uh, initial comments. You'll have to be a little bit patient. He's just gotten off a boat, uh, so <laughs> there's salt spray on his tie, and I think this is the first time he's worn dress shoes in, in several <laughs> weeks. Um, uh, and then uh, uh, we're going to have uh, a chance for uh, Robert and Nicole uh, and Catherine to come back with comments as well. And Nicole just got off a plane, uh, so we're, we're, everyone here is freshly traveled. Um, and then that should take us uh, into about half an hour of presentations, and then we're going to move right to you. So we're hoping that you'll spend a little bit of time ahead um, preparing some comments and questions and feedback to the panelists. So that's how we're going to operate today. should be uh, fun and informal. Uh, we also have uh, folks online. We have about 50 people who joined us uh, through the webcast. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, so, Dr. Berkeley, over to you. So, thanks so much, and I am delighted to be here, but um, I might be operating a little slower than I normally <laughs> do, so I, uh, I hope you'll forgive me. And I also wanted to uh, compliment um, Catherine on the excellent uh, report that um, I got to read on the plane coming up last <laughs> night. Um, and um, it's really exciting to be here, as always. Um, uh, let me just say a few words about Gavi, and I know many of you in the audience are very familiar, but I, I think it's really been an extraordinary ride. Um, uh, immunization, critically important priority. To me, it's the kind of base of the pyramid of the whole healthcare system in most of the countries we're talking about. And, you know, it's been quite successful. We got to universal childhood immunization with Jim Grant, and uh, we're you know, maybe not quite 80%, maybe 75%, but um, with the basic six antigens, and, and then it drifted off from there. And Gavi was born at a time when a number of attempts had been done, but in 2000 at the World Economic Forum, create a new public-private partnership that really would try to bring all of the critical groups around the table to focus on, on vaccines and to introduce new vaccines that needed to be moved forward. And, you know, if I fast forward to today, quite successful. We've immunized 440 million additional children. We've uh, prevented more than 6 million uh, future deaths, um, uh, w which were averted. So, I think in that sense, quite successful. Um, we, we've increased the number of vaccines dramatically. Now there are vaccines against diarrhea and pneumonia, the two largest killers of children. We have two cancer vaccines that are being used as part of this. We have regional vaccines, for example, uh, meningitis A, which across the meningitis belt caused havoc for 
you know, eons, and now you see the disease disappearing in those places with these vaccines. So I think in a sense, a really extraordinary model. Um, traditionally, Gavi had started with one vaccine and grew slowly and organically, and it had its first replenishment in 2011. In that replenishment, um, uh, it was not a good financial time. Um, there were some uh, challenges Gavi had gone through in the period before that, and the world came together and, and um, really uh, you know, had an extraordinary performance. Um, uh, the ask at that point was exceeded um, in that replenishment, and um, Gavi was off uh, to now deliver on its promises. And when I joined Gavi, it was to implement this new strategy that had been uh, developed during that period, which is, was to immunize from 11 to 15, a quarter of a billion children, and prevent an additional around 4 million deaths. Um, we had a midterm review um, uh, at the end of last year, and we were happy to say that um, overall, we were on target to meet those high-level goals. However, there were a number of other goals that were challenging, and I think this takes us to what the challenges are of the next period, and that related to some of the issues around equity, some of the countries that still had low coverage, and today, 22 million children are under-immunized in the world, and most of those are living in Gavi countries. So as we look forward to the next period, what's going to happen? And the, the board right now is putting together a strategy. Robert might say something about that, but um, we had a board retreat in Berlin now two weeks ago where we spent a full day going over um, kind of where the strategy is, and hopefully we'll have a new strategy approved in June. And, and the real part of that strategy is going to be multiple fold. One is we really need to continue doing what we're doing. We need to finish the job that was being done. We're in the process of rolling out vaccines. We've been increasing the number of vaccine rollouts. In 2011, there were 22 vaccine rollouts. In 2015, it's estimated to be 71 before we add IPV. So you can see the dramatic increases in, in uh, new vaccines that are being rolled out. And but IPV is? Uh, inactivated polio vaccine, which we can come back to. Thanks. Uh, that's in support of the uh, end game strategy of the polio eradication effort. Um, so um, there is this scale up going on, but then the question is, is what about countries that are fragile? What about countries that have low coverage? What kind of special work can we do with those? So that's gonna be one key component. A second component is about equity. Um, today, um, with the basic vaccines, four out of five children get them, and that's <coughs> better than any other intervention out there. On the other hand, that means that one out of five isn't. And these are, uh, um, uh, Chris Elias once uh, made this statement, which I love, which is the, the problem is that fifth child is not standing together with the other four children. And so how do we reach those children? How do we change the systems to do that? And to do that, we really need to modernize the systems we've got. The, the, the immunization system has not really been um, modernized um, you know, since the 1960s when um, it was basically a paper and pen system. And obviously, high quality data is critical and being able to understand where these uh, children that are being missed are, what the issues are, what the systems are, where the vaccines are, where the cold chain is, all of those issues need to be worked on. So that's gonna be a critical component. The other major thing about the Gavi strategy is there's two other parts. Now, I've talked a little bit about replenishment, but there's two other key components. One is the cost of vaccines. And as we know, vaccines, um, when they're new and innovative, and today we have some of the most complex vaccines ever made. For example, one of the pneumococcal vaccines is 13 strains in it. That's really 13 vaccines put together in one expensive, complicated, how do we get the cost down while keeping the quality up, while keeping uh, you know, business able to continue to innovate is a critical priority for us. But if we can drive the cost down, then that allows sustainability, and, and sustainability is critical to what we're doing. So working with industry in doing um, activities to, to improve the marketplace, not only in, in, in reducing prices and improving <coughs> quality, but also in increasing healthy competition, in making sure there's adequate suppliers. And Gavi has been quite successful since 2011. We've seen on the, the major three vaccines a 35% reduction in price. We've seen more manufacturers come, particularly from um, uh, developing country manufacturers coming in, creating a healthy marketplace. And this is going to be cr 
critical to sustaining it. But the third part of our virtual triangle is the fact that countries need to contribute, and this is a very important part of Gavi's program. There is no free lunch here. Every country that wants a Gavi vaccine has to contribute something. If you're very, very poor, they contribute a little. As the countries get wealthier, they contribute more until eventually they graduate. Graduation today is at $1,570. It's an odd number because it's adjusted for inflation. And when those, those countries graduate, um, uh, what's important is that they have the fiscal space to be able to pay for those vaccines. So when you're a, a poor country initially, um, you want to bring these vaccines out. It would cost six, eight, ten percent of your health expenditure. Clearly, you know, although I think it's a good buy, too much for countries to handle. By the time they graduate, we're talking about on average about 0.5 to 0.6 percent of their health budgets, which is the fiscal space that countries should be able to spend. But during this next period, we have 20 countries graduating. And so what's going to be critical is making sure that those countries have the maximum chance of success to be able to sustain these programs. And that's going to require working with companies to make sure that um, for a while they have uh, continued uh, access to Gavi pricing, that as um, uh, prices increase over time, which they will, that they go up at a, at a level that countries can sustain and can be able to afford. Um, and that um, countries that have particular challenges, and there are a number of them that are in the graduating cohort, particularly countries who are um, uh, so-called commodity middle-income countries, countries who have gotten wealthy because of commodities haven't necessarily invested in their systems, there is a risk that those countries particularly are going to have problems. And so how do we work with those countries to make sure that their graduation is as successful as possible? So these are some of the challenges that are going on in the next period. Let me say that the next period will be the largest period of funding for Gavi. And the reason is, is that we will be purchasing the most number of vaccine doses. Um, in the next period, it's estimated we'll be purchasing 2.7 billion doses of vaccine. Um, and, um, and, and during this period, obviously, we'll also continue to invest in health systems, invest in graduating countries, but after this, these numbers of countries graduate, we're going to see the costs coming down. So in essence, during this period, we're going to have to go out to governments and, and make the case to say that this is a good investment, it's a cost-effective investment, it's effective investment, but that during this period and during a tough financial time that we actually need more money to be able to cover this period of getting these vaccines you know, up to high levels of coverage, getting them out to as many mm -hmm. children as possible, and working with countries towards their graduation. So with that, maybe I'll stop, and obviously I'm happy to answer questions. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Robert, uh, the US has been a supporter of Gavi from the early days. The AID administrator, when he was at the Gates Foundation, helped to get Gavi off the ground. Uh, It'd be great to hear from you where the U.S. is, whether it's a sport, what's the, what's the lead up to the replenishment discussion, and, and what does Seth need to tell you and, and the U.S. Congress in order to attract uh, even greater resources. Good. Well, thanks, Todd. And, and it's great to be back. I, I was at an event earlier this week at CSIS, <laughs> and, and you all do a great service of bringing people together, and, and the reports that you produce are actually quite helpful to, uh, to the community. Um, I think most of you know that uh, USAID has two major goals in, in global health. One is uh, an AIDS-free generation, the other is ending preventable child and maternal deaths. And if you look at uh, the uh, ending preventable child and maternal deaths, I mean, vaccines has a really critical role to play in terms of achieving the, the bold vision that we're, we're looking at. And so that's why the US government is really um, supporting Gavi. Uh, we were one of the first bilateral donors, I think, with Norway. Uh, we've been a continued uh, supporter over the time. I think now we're over a billion dollars in our support. And when you, know, when you uh, sort of, in these di budget discussions, there are always trade-offs. We have to determine where do we put a limited amount of resources. And I think why Gavi has continued to, to get support from the U.S. is, is uh, what Seth was talking about, the results that it achieves. Uh, the number of children uh, immunized, 440 million children, uh, estimated, you know, six million children's lives saved. Those are real tangible results um, that are very, uh, very important, and it uh, really helps us uh, realize that bold vision that we have in the future. But it doesn't end there, and I think that's very important to state. 
my, my impression or my experience with Gavi is that it's really grappling with some of the fundamental issues of development. And um, when, you, when you look at country ownership, you're looking at reaching the fifth child, getting that access out to the farthest reach, bringing in other partners, growing the pie, I think Gavi is on the cutting edge. And, and I've learned quite a bit, and I think others in the field have learned from Gavi's experience of really pushing uh, our understanding of how we do uh, health and development in, in general. And I think we've, we've appreciated that, and that's why we support the program. The, the new strategy, I think, continues that tradition of really looking at how we, how we do things uh, differently or how we get down into the real uh, nitty gritty of, of how we make uh, long-term investments sustainable and stick. Uh, the the co-financing, uh, where we have governments that are committing themselves in the last strategy that's estimated about 5% of the funds came from governments. We're looking at now around 15% for governments to contribute. Donors' resources would be going down because of that uh, increase from, from local resources. And also, what's been very innovative for Gavi has been the market shaping work. And um, the, you know, an increase in that projected over the next uh, strategic period so that we all have lower prices as we move forward. So I think those are very important. The innovative financing, the, the uh, bringing in you know, loan guarantees and working with other partners, I think has been uh, cutting edge and has been very important for, for our support. Um, and I think, you know, again, sort of going back to this theme of really tackling the hard uh, issues, I've been part of the health system strengthening uh, advisory group for, for Seth this past year. And, um, you know, Gavi has tried uh, early on to, to focus more on how do you build health systems. I think it was a very broad approach and it didn't have the results that people uh, were expecting. But now we've actually gone back, looked at the drawing board, looked at ways in which we can invest and make an impact both on building the systems but also having an impact in immunization. And I think some of that discussion and dialogue has been very, very important. And it's, um, it's one of the reasons, again, why, why we uh, continue to support Gavi and, and it's moving forward. I would also add in, uh, that Gavi is not the only thing we support. Uh, we do feel that uh, it's, a, it's an innovator and it's an important component, but we also have a broader MCH program. We have uh, other work that goes on in terms of immunization. Uh, we would like to see more work go into routine immunization programs through our bilateral assistance. Uh, we do the best we can, but we are hoping that as Gavi moves forward, particularly on the polio front with uh, the Global Polio uh, Eradication Initiative, uh, GPEI, that we get much more uh, engaged in building the routine system because that's the way we're going to sustain this over the long run. So we're looking forward to that. Um, and then finally, it's maybe repeating a little bit, but the, but the ownership by countries and the graduation I think is, is uh, a really important phase that we're going through and getting that graduation, the criteria, the support that's needed, making sure we don't backslide as countries move into their own financing and also, how do we support countries that are middle income so that they can use their resources and their abilities to address poor people in their countries, people that aren't immunized, because they're gonna continue to be large cohorts in these countries. But the question is, how do we interact with this growing amount of resources that are available in, in developing countries, uh, particularly middle income countries, and utilize those funds in a better way to achieve the results? Thanks, Robert. So, Nicole, uh, Gates Foundation has obviously been a prime supporter of, of Gabby, helped get it started, uh, provided large amounts of resources, one of the top donors. Uh, I s probably guess that Seth Berkeley is on Bill Gates' speed dial. Um, <laughs> where is the foundation in terms of helping make the case for Gabby, and, and what are the challenges you see in the U audience, and, and how do you think Gabby can use the the results that Seth talked about uh, to make the case here in a way that will impel the U.S. to provide even more. Sure. Thanks, Todd. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's great to be here. Let me add my congratulations to Catherine for a very smart report. Very much agree that CAS puts out products that captures the history and the strategic investment opportunity in a way that's just incredibly helpful for public and political dialogue, so thank you for that. It actually seems just like yesterday that we were in uh, London. It was June 2011 and a set of global stakeholders came together in a really impressive and energetic event to say two things or message two things to the world. 
One is that collectively we all value the value of vaccines and the contributions that they make to health and broader economic development. And two, we actually have a vote of confidence in the Gavi Alliance as the mechanism that can help us to reach that shared goal of saving children's lives. So it's really, as you've heard from Seth, as you've heard from Robert already, since that time, Gavi has basically done what they said they would do. And that's why donors and other stakeholders continue to be highly supportive and positive on Gavi and the potential that we have over this next period, 2016 to 2020. So you've heard about the number of children who have been reached. You've heard about the number of future uh, deaths prevented or averted. Um, and you've also heard about the number of vaccine introductions, but also impressively the pace of those introductions. It was not long ago that it could take upwards of 20 years when a vaccine was first available to when it actually got introduced in the poorest countries and actually reached the kids who needed it most. Gavi has actually proven through their model that they can change that curve, that they can accelerate introduction. And, in a, and because of that, we're actually saving more kids sooner and that's for greater long-term results. So it's really based off of this foundation again that we're looking to 2016 and 2020 to continue that momentum. So let me make three main points. The first is why does the foundation invest in immunization and specifically in Gavi? So immunizations, um, Gavi specifically, polio as well, they are the top, the top priority of the Gates Foundation. We believe that uh, children deserve a healthy start to life. We believe that vaccines are a way to do that. So that instead of focusing on getting over sickness or instead of experiencing an unfortunate death, kids can just get onto the business of growing and, and being healthy. Um, and we like that. And we believe and we have seen that vaccines are a proven safe intervention to help us achieve that. So on top of that, we also have observed that Gavi is an innovative model. It is a public-private partnership. We say Gavi in shorthand, but it is an alliance. It involves WHO, UNICEF, countries, the private sector, CSOs, importantly, in that work. And so that's super and critical because it's not just one entity, but it's a collective effort. And that's what you need for, to achieve goals as ambitious as we're trying to achieve with child health. And it's for that reason that to date the foundation has committed $2.5 billion to the work of the Gavi Alliance and looks forward to partnering with other donors and other stakeholders to continue the momentum in this next period of replenishment. So as I mentioned on the model, Gavi again has changed the trajectory of how and when new vaccines are introduced into poor countries. We've shaved um, decades off of the time that it takes to help improve health. Um, Robert spoke about, and Seth, I believe you spoke as well, about what previously was called the three-legged stool, right? Donors have been incredibly generous, either through direct contributions, through innovative financing mechanisms, very diverse ways of getting money into the system to help finance vaccine introduction. Industry has come on board in a way they demonstrate great innovation. There are many more suppliers today than there were at the beginning of um, actually even just a few years ago. And what that's doing is it's making sure that vaccine supply is there, it's making sure that quality is there, and it's making sure that vaccines are affordable because you have competition in the market and that's hugely important. And finally, Robert gave the specific statist statistic on the fact that countries are co-financing and will continue to pay more over time, particularly as countries begin to graduate. So that means a few things when you take the market and countries into, into account. One is that the donor dollar goes further right, because the vaccine is less expensive, you reach more kids with that same amount of money, and then countries are also pitching in. So there's just collective buy-in into what we're trying to do. So I'll just close out by a quick look ahead. So to date, donor confidence is fairly high. Again, in the model, Gavi has enjoyed um, very high ratings in multilateral aid reviews by the UK, by Australia, also by Sweden. Um, the midterm results have been very clear that we are on track. And so now I'm gonna to get to the cliche part of these, these panel discussions, which is in the environment is changing, right? It is a tough fiscal environment. Um, there are competing priorities. We could say this, insert your issue or your agenda, <laughs> but we all have that same experience, but it's very true for immunization and child health. So there are a couple of things that need to happen. One is that Gavi is gonna to have to do an incredibly strong job of articulating its updated value proposition, right? They've done a good job to date. What does this next phase look like? And as you've heard, the board is having those conversations around relevant policy and program decisions that will help them get there. The second piece is that along with the success, there are new realities. Countries are now demanding these vaccines, so we have to make sure that they're available and that they're affordable and that they are reaching that fifth child who is not standing with the other four. Um, in this period, as Seth said, this is kind of a, a, a peak. And so hopefully we can get over this hump of heaviest spending and then start to see this development model really kick in. But during this time, you're gonna have a record number of countries graduating. That's a new experience. 
can they actually pick up financially? Is the political will there? Do we have advocacy capacity in these countries to actually help take some of the pressure off of donors and make sure that this is actually a sustainable model? So those are the kinds of things that we're thinking about. So all to say that the Gates Foundation feels that Gavi is an incredibly capable organization. It has incredibly strong leadership that has been very effective over the past, um, since 2011. I'm just off of a plane, I can't add that quickly. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's great, huge political support. CSOs are playing a huge role in um, implementation in advocacy, but also in accountability and holding Gavi accountable for doing what they said that they do. So collectively, I think that we're teed up for huge success. That's why we're in, um, and that's why we're looking forward to partnering with all stakeholders over this next period. Great, we'll come back to some of the questions around middle income countries and how a uh, number of donors are graduating countries all at the same time and what are the implications for that. And I'm, I'm curious as to whether or not you're seeing the implications of the vaxophobia that seem to have mm -hmm taken over in the U.S. and whether or not mm -hmm. that's a political challenge. Last night on the news, I don't know if you saw, a lot of reports are on spikes and measles uh, and that mm -hmm. crazy stuff that seems to happen only in this country. So No, it's not only in this country. <laughs> I'm mostly in this country. Uh, <laughs> Catherine, uh, fantastic paper. You've laid out three questions that you think Gabby needs to mm -hmm. answer. Uh, so did you get the answers? Wh where are we at in terms <laughs> of uh, getting from Gabby the information that the world needs to make the case that Nicole uh, requires to, to help with the advocacy? Well, thank you. Um, I wanted to just say a little bit about the origins of this report and, and the questions that are posed and some of the recommendations around U.S. engagement and how the United States can think about its approach as it looks forward to the replenishment later this year. Um, basically, this, this took place over kind of three phases. I was able to attend the Gavi midterm review in Stockholm in October of 2013 and was able to learn about both progress during the current phase and interview some of the partners and stakeholders about their impressions and, and their thoughts about the upcoming replenishment. I traveled to Geneva in December to meet with Secretariat staff and with other locally based partners. And then I carried out phone and personal <coughs> interviews over the last few months. And one thing I can tell you is that I don't think anyone turned down my request for an interview. People were incredibly supportive and enthusiastic about Gavi. I had people actually asking if they could review drafts of the, uh, of the report. And it just, it was really, very interesting to see the enthusiasm and the support that, that was generated. Uh, the analysis focused on two sets of questions. Uh, the first was, what are the questions that decision makers, uh, particularly those in the United States, are going to be thinking about or looking for in the run up to the replenishment? And the second group was, what are the concrete, practical recommendations for the United States to consider as it develops its own approach to the replenishment um, in supporting Gavi's work? So the first three questions, you know, the kind of the three key questions that I focused on were, how well is the Gavi model of promoting vaccine uptake through advocacy, market shaping activities, and the health system strengthening work? Um, how well is that working, and what steps is the alliance taking to address problem areas? Are Gavi-supported countries successfully moving toward greater co-financing and sustainable ownership of, of domestic vaccine programs? And what are the secretariat and partners doing to ensure smooth graduation processes? And then finally, how robust is donor appetite for increasing contributions? And how realistic is it for Gavi to expand its resource base over, the, you know, over this next period? So I think the other panelists have really addressed the first two issues, so I'll focus on the third and on the recommendations for US engagement. On the resource mobilization side, you know, it seems like kind of the biggest unknowns are, will the kind of traditional core base of donors increase their contributions in this round? as they did at the historic uh, replenishment in 2011 that, that Nicole mentioned, when Gavi actually got more than, than, it's asked, than it asked for during that, during that replenishment. And then the second is, to what extent will new or emerging donors, whether government or the private sector, step up uh, either in this particular replenishment, you know, actually at the, the conference or over the next phase of operations? And you know, some of the factors that, that emerged from discussions and, and interviews and that, that really kind of filtered out were you know, one that the global fund replenishment in 2013 could kind of provide a preview for how some donors are, are thinking about things, where we saw some conditionality uh, attached to, to some of the pledges. Uh, so it's possible we could see some of that for Gavi, which, which might have pluses and minuses. Um, you know, the second is that it may be possible to see increases uh, from some of the, the longtime you know, supporters like Germany and, and the EU but it may be less likely to see increases during this phase from France and Australia and the Netherlands, which have seen some tightening of aid budgets over the, the last period. 
you know, one question is what about new donors? Uh, we saw that South Africa and Brazil have both pledged to the International Financial Facility for Immunizations around a million dollars a year over a 20-year period. Um, certainly, you know, the IFM funds are an essential component of Gavi's funding model, and it's important to get those countries involved. But that spreads the, it spreads that out over a long-term period and kind of front loads the, the pledge with the, the money extended over a couple of decades. India has recently made a commitment for a direct contribution of $4 million over four years. So a similarly important, uh, important pledge, yet not necessarily the, the kind of monies that are really going to push that, that next uh, budget amount forward. Haven't seen a lot from many of the other emerging economies yet, but it may be that, that there's, there's more in the pipeline. So I think in the looking ahead, it's going to be essential to engage the traditional donors to be sure, but over the long term, Gavi is going to need to develop a greater, you know, whether it's a diplomatic capacity or just outreach capacity, to reach those emerging economies and make the case over the next period. Just a few of the recommendations. Um, in the short term, what I argued in the paper is that the US should increase its funding with a three-year pledge, recognizing that US commitments to Gavi and bilateral child health assistance, as Robert pointed out, are complementary and mutually reinforcing. Um, U.S. policymakers might want to condition future increases on better data or thinking about some of the sustainability of the graduation schemes, but that might be, you know, over the next replenishment period, kind of looking ahead to the next one. Um, reaching out diplomatically to the U.S. constituent bloc, which includes Australia, Japan, and South Korea, to encourage them to increase their own contributions during this upcoming replenishment is certainly a practical a practical step that could be taken. And the same, I think, could be true for U.S. ambassadors to some of the middle-income countries that have become more engaged on global health to encourage them to make direct contributions or to increase their support during this period. Um, in the longer term, I think the U.S. can ensure that its own bilateral assistance and technical assistance around immunizations is complementary to uh, what happens in the field and you know, to make sure that staff at the U.S. mission level in the fields are aware of the work that uh, Gavi is undertaking in those countries and find opportunities to, to complement that work. And then finally, I think, you know, because the United States, uh, through the Agency for International Development, has its own experience around some of the graduation issues and has lessons to share from that, I think that um, sharing some of that history and some of that experience can also be useful as Gavi thinks about its own graduation processes. And so I guess if, if I may take the, the liberty of kind of throwing a question out here as well, um, you know, certainly the, I think the question of, of graduation and how that graduation process is going to unfold, you know, is one that, um, you know, where there are likely to be, you know, some challenges over the next period. So I'd be interested, Seth, to hear you just, you know, speak a little bit about how the, the alliance is, is kind of trying to anticipate what some of those might be and, and at the same time, you know, we'd just like to follow up on this question about some of the middle income countries and what some of the thinking around how to, um, you know, ensure that it might be possible to reach those uh, vulnerable populations in countries that are really, at this point, not Gavi eligible. So I'd stop there. So thanks. I think that's a, it's a great start off question. I mean, most of my experiences with the Global Fund and many of the issues that are, that are, are hitting Gavi, as you said, Robert, are also hitting the Global Fund. Uh, maybe a little bit later in terms of response, so you guys are ahead of the curve in, in some ways. But this question around how to address middle-income countries where uh, over 70% of the poorest people in the world now live uh, is a real outstanding one. You know, we have uh, a, a similar approach with the Global Fund where financing is connected to GNI per capita. So as country GNI levels rise, uh, their co-financing expectations change, uh, and in some cases their eligibility uh, is impacted. And that means that for places where you actually see rising disease rates uh, and rising income rates, there's a disconnect. Uh, and certainly at the board, you have some donors who look at this very much as the fifth child is their primary priority, and in the past that was all about low-income countries. <coughs> Struggling to figure out what a donor responsibility is and therefore what a Gavi and a Global Fund should be doing in these middle-income countries is more of a challenge. Market shaping is maybe one. It'd be great to hear how you're thinking about that, and then how does a country that's looking at graduation from Gavi and graduation from IDA and graduation from Global Fund and graduation from concessionary pricing from companies uh, respond to the poorest people that they continue to have to serve? So lots of great questions and lots of discussions will kick off here. Um, let me start. I'm, I'm uh, actually going this afternoon. There's going to be a, a seminar at the Sabin Foundation, um, which is their 20th year anniversary. And one of the slides that I prepared for that um, is about the perfect storm of Nigeria. 
<laughs> and Nigeria is going to go towards graduation. And if you look at the donors, which I have listed on one side of the slide, and they will progressively disappear, as you just described. And it turns out that about 51% of their health budget is going to disappear with that. Now, you know, not going to be all exactly at the same time, but the bigger challenge in Nigeria is what is the commitment of the government to spend on vaccines? Because year after year, at the last minute, money has been taken out of the pot for routine vaccines and has been used for other sources, and they've ended up with some of the lowest coverage of any Gavi country, despite that there is substantial wealth in Nigeria. And so I think this is really the challenge that we have to work on. So what am I worried about in graduation? Countries that have had a slow economic development and have invested appropriately in their social systems, I think will do fine. Is it a challenge? Absolutely. But with time, with working with the Ministry of Finance, with having people understand the importance of this, they'll do fine. What I worry about are countries such as Papua New Guinea, which has a lot of wealth now because of the minerals that are there and the mining that's going on, et cetera, but that hasn't been funneled back into the social system. And so, you know, will they really make it a priority to continue it? Now, you can make an argument in a country like that that, in fact, since so little of the systems work, immunization mm -hmm. is one that can work better than others. And, of course, in that case, the government certainly should, but will they? And I think that is really the challenge that mm -hmm. we're going to have to deal with. And so, to Nicole's point, we, we need is in this next phase a whole new different phase of engaging. Now, somebody described Gavi as the, as the best uh, 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 known secret in global health. And the reason is, is up until now, Gavi has not been about promoting Gavi. We don't have a product red. We don't have a, you know, friends of the a fund. Gavi's been about countries investing in their immunization and delivering it. It's been about partners helping them. And, you know, Gavi has been known in, in small elite circles, obviously, to funders and others, but hasn't had that kind of general visibility. And one of the questions is, do we need to do more visibility? And in countries, do we need to do more engagement on political advocacy to make sure that countries are being held accountable for this. Yeah. Um, and, and this is going to be absolutely critical if we're going to succeed in the next period. Um, some of the issues that were brought up in the report, the issue of conditionality, I think that's a, you know, it's a, it's one that has to be dealt with carefully. Done well, it's helpful in terms of leveraging other donors, but you can also end up in a situation, you could imagine, where you end up with multiple conditionalities and you end up not being able to maximize the resources available, which would be tragic because they will lead to ultimately death. So I think we have to be careful in, in, in how one thinks about that. Um, in terms of, of increasing uh, uh, donors, um, you didn't mention one very important one, which is the Middle East. Now, it turns out that 48 percent of the children that Gavi serves are actually in OIC countries, mm -hmm. and uh, that's the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. Um, and, and, and yet the only support that Gavi receives from uh, countries in that band are from uh, a very generous gift from the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi, who gave $30 uh, million in the last period. But um, there's obviously, um, you know, uh, discussions going on to try to see if we can increase engagement mm -hmm. there. Uh, four of the five BRICs have supported Gavi now. The one that hasn't is China. Again, um, China has a very interesting history with Gavi where um, uh, we worked with them on hepatitis B, mm -hmm. uh, where they had a terrible problem, 350,000 cases of liver cancer a year, high uh, hepatitis B in infants. And today, it's gone from 10% to less than 1% of infants having hepatitis B carriage. And therefore, those cancer rates are going to drop. Mm -hmm. And it's seen as a great success. But also, China has now entered with its first pre-qualified vaccine. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they're engaging in this as a, as a supplier as well. And how do we work with them? We're trying to help China enter, but also, obviously, assuring quality of of uh, vaccines is going to be critical because quality today anywhere in the world is the same as um, in any one country because if there is a problem with quality it affects you know the trust that we talked about that leads to some of these problems which aren't just u.s problems they may be magnified here but in terms of the anti-vaccine movement that exists um, we've been working very hard to try to engage um, uh, some of the, the the donors that are, are punching below their weight in this um, in terms of uh, engagement and having discussions with Germany and Japan and the EC as potential supporters. The U.S. has been increasing its share. It's now about 8% of 
of global support, just uh, below uh, Norway in terms of a, a, of a donor for, for Gavi. And, and you know, I think the challenge uh, for us in this next period is <coughs> can we make the case, can we get people to step up to the plate um, to a level that will allow us to be able to um, uh, get over this hump that, that uh, Nicole uh, so carefully described. Robert, any comments on the, uh, the recommendations or the questions that came out of Catherine's paper and this question around what to do with, yeah. with some of these graduating countries? Yeah, so a uh, couple of comments. One, you know, we talked about um, th the importance of the new strategy, and we've had some really, uh, I think, productive uh, dialogue with both the donors in a workshop as well as the board retreat. And one of the points that keeps coming up in terms of graduation is that we, we need to be more sophisticated in our um, analysis. Uh, we tend to look at national uh, figures, and particularly for large states uh, that have federal systems where a state is, a, uh, is more where the health is. Um, we need to be looking at, at disaggregated data and looking at what's, how states are performing. And I know that personally, uh, having lived five years in India, that um, you know, the, the, the overall numbers may look great, but then you'll have uh, you know, the Northern Belt, uh, Bihar, UP, that really are more like African states. And so we need to be thinking much more sophisticated about pockets within countries and how we move forward. So that was a point I wanted to make. Can I just make one point on that? Yep. The Uttar Pradesh, which is one of the states you mentioned, yeah. has a, um, the second largest number of under-immunized kids in the world after Nigeria, if it was a freestanding country. And its per capita income is around $400 if it was a state. So if it was a separate country, you'd say, my god, this is one of the poorest, mm -hmm. one of the largest you know, problems of under-immunized kids. But it sits within a country that people say, well, you know, they're sending rockets to space, and they have a nuclear program. And therefore, mm -hmm. you know, it's just about internal reallocation. But we know how difficult that yeah. is. And I, and I think you know, India, the national government, does have a, a lot more responsibility for uh, addressing those uh, lagging areas, but, but states are really the drivers of the health initiative, and I think we have to look at how to support those states. I, I, I fully agree that you know, as donors have come in, particularly in some of the real high priority areas of HIV, AIDS, uh, and, and malaria, and so forth, we have crowded out government resources. And it's, it's a logical decision that a finance minister makes. He's got lots of money over here, so he moves his own money. On. So we, we, we need to be thinking how we bring them back in. And, uh, and I, there's a lot of discussion now about, in these countries, how do we move them from grant aid to, um, to mix loans, uh, you know, uh, subsidized loans to more c commercial loans, and so that they have ownership um, in, in this area as we move forward in the future. So there's, there's some, a lot of discussion about, th and also how do we generate domestic resources through taxation and other things to improve the, the financing. Um, in terms of the recommendations on the outreach, I mm -hmm. just wanted to share that uh, we're working very closely with the Global Diplomacy Office at the State Department. And uh, we've set up now a system where all ambassadors, U.S. ambassadors going out get briefed on global health. And so I've been involved personally in quite a few uh, briefings uh, where we have talked about Gavi. Um, the ambassador to Canada, for example, we talked to him about the, the prospects of, of uh, Gavi and how the importance of Gavi in terms of, uh, uh, of achieving our results. Um, but also, uh, ambassadors going to the Middle East, and uh, so there's quite an active um, outreach going on through our own ambassadors, but also we pledged in the, um, that we would use our diplomatic uh, clout uh, outreach uh, to, uh, to talk to countries as we move forward in the replenishment. Uh, next week, we're having a delegation from Japan. Uh, I'll be meeting with them on Monday. Uh, again, we brought this up in previous meetings, but we'll be talking to them also about the best buy of Gavi and how they can be uh, helping on that. Um, and then finally, I would say uh, the recommendation about um, more participation at the country level. Mm -hmm. We really appreciate that recommendation um, because in some ways our field staff, they see Gavi as either a central contribution or a, you know, a multilateral, but it's somehow something other than what they're responsible, which is largely the bilateral, but in fact, with, with our assistance, uh, we have a, a big role to play, particularly where we need the eyes and ears in some countries in addition to uh, WHO and UNICEF. So we're talking to our field staff, making sure that they're, as the health officers there, are quite engaged and provide us with the feedback that we need 
uh, on programs as we move forward. Certainly been a part of the ship with between the U.S. Uh, uh, bilateral programs and the Global Fund on HIV, yeah. and TB, and malaria, where you've started to see rather less antagonism and yeah, more cooperation. Yeah, and working together in partnership. Yeah. And that's really one of the keys of the alliance that um, Nicole talked about. It's an alliance of, of groups, and that partnership has been one of the strengths. Nicole. So not too much more to add here on graduation, um, but I think that Nigeria is a really interesting case study um, of many countries because again, just because you make it to a certain level of eligibility or something on paper does not, 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 not mean that that's what it is in practice and it's certainly not uniform through across the country. And so the true test of success, not just for Gavi, but for development in general, is once you make an investment, are you actually setting the countries up to carry themselves mm -hmm. forward? And so that really is a part of the work. And I think that I'm coming from an advocacy perspective and a political will background, and we spend a lot of time in donor markets talking about that value to get donors to invest, which has in some ways uh, displaced, uh, I guess we use the language supplant rather than support, um, some of the domestic <laughs> spending. But we really need to think about how do you generate public demand, not just for the product, but for the political commitment um, that will carry it forward. So in addition to that, the only other piece that I would add is thinking about a glide path. So it's not, you know, here's the, the deadline date and it's on and off, but it's really kind of a trickle down or a scale up, however you'd like to see it. Um, but that's really how we're gonna get to sustainable sustainability. Great, so um, I, I wanna turn to the audience. So one last quick question, which is, uh, as you said, Seth, in the beginning, uh, part of the reason that Gabby was established was not only to make sure that routine immunizations were widely available, but also to uh, help with the uh, expedited access to new uh, vaccines. And you've done that with rotavirus, you've done that with HPV, um, and the, the specifically divine, uh, designed uh, meningitis vaccine. What else is coming at you, and, and, and how much additional money do you have to raise in order to deal with that? You've got, obviously, IPV, which you mentioned. If you could tell us a little bit about what that's gonna look like. There's discussions around a malaria vaccine. There's increased call for more routine immunization with cholera vaccines. You know, what else is coming at you from the, from the innovation stuff that Bill Gates is investing in that you're gonna end up having to pay for? How does that factor into your uh, estimates of what you need out of this replenishment? So thanks. Um, we, we try to look strategically. And in, in the old days, Gavi would, you know, a new vaccine would appear and then we'd discuss that vaccine and then another vaccine would appear and you'd discuss that. And so the way it's structured now is we have a vaccine investment strategy that's done every five years. We just finished that. And what we do is we start out and ask the question in the next five years, what is existing now that could be rolled out? What's new in the pipeline that is likely or even has a chance of being licensed in the next period? And it turns out that this last vaccine investment strategy, we started out looking at close to 60 different vaccines that were possible, um, existing or new. Uh, that was whittled down to a smaller list and then an incredibly complex process of consultation with the public, with technical experts, um, uh, uh, building up the cases for the vaccines, understanding cost effectiveness, delivery systems, efficiencies, what do we know about, and then ended up with a, um, a few vaccines being recommended. Um, the one vaccine that you mentioned that um, you know, sat on the cusp was the malaria vaccine. Mm -hmm. And the problem was it was a little early in in, in timing in that the, the critical data on duration of protection and boosting of vaccine wasn't available. And so the board did something unusual. It didn't say no, but it also didn't say yes. It said we will look at that data when it comes in and then make a decision on it. But um, I, I think in terms of going forward, that vaccine, if it was um, uh, to, to be rolled out, um, that decision wouldn't occur until that data is there, until the SAGE uh, does a um, recommendation. Uh, that, that's the strategic advisory group of experts of WHO that we rely on for these uh, expertise on when and how you'd use a vaccine. And then until that vaccine was pre-qualified. So we're still talking about some timeline and in the next period, that would be a relatively small um, uh, uh, cost um, although in the years yeah. after it could be quite high depending upon what the recommendations were gonna be. Other vaccines that are around and that are being discussed, um, a dengue, a very important vaccine, mm -hmm. doesn't cause a lot of uh, mortality but causes a lot of morbidity. Um, rabies is a vaccine that's been around for years. Um, we're gonna do some studies during this period. Um, one of the problems with rabies is that if you have it available, it gets used and it gets used a lot. 
And one of the challenges is it does save lives, but you can't keep up with the demand given how common bites are. So what are the ways to use it that would make mm -hmm. sense? And you can't get it out to every place. You'd have to have some central location. So we're going to try to look at that. Um, a yellow fever has changed its epidemiology, so the board has approved uh, going out and, and um, doing some more campaigns for places that have new yellow fever epidemics. Um, we also discussed um, a cholera stockpile with an understanding that cholera, um, we don't really know how to use it in, in um, endemic settings. Um, so a cholera stockpile has been set up for epidemics, and the idea is that um, with vaccine doses that will be expiring, using some of those to try to understand how to use it in routine settings. And one of the places this is going to be most acute is in Haiti that continues to have an, a kind of a halfway between an epidemic and endemic setting. Um, and the argument that's gone on between water and sanitation and vaccines, should it be one or should it be the other? And the answer, of course, is in that circumstance, it should be both. Um, how do we use it? What can we learn from that? So it's important that as we think about that, we learn about it. The last vaccine that was discussed as part of the vaccine investment strategy was influenza in, in, in pregnant women. And, um, and there just wasn't enough data to make the case for um, whether that made sense as an intervention globally. But that's something, again, we'll, we'll look at carefully because um, that might be a vaccine that's important, um, particularly in the neonatal period. And, Today, with all the success we've had in child survival, I mean, it's been wonderful. We, yes, we haven't, uh, you know, we're not on target to meet the Millennium Development Goal of a two-third reduction in under five mortality, but we're, you know, around 50 percent, which is extraordinary, um, given the fact that population uh, sizes are going up. Uh, 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 deaths have been reduced to, you know, six and a half million from, you know, more than 12 and a half when we started. Um, but because we've had such good success with vaccines and other interventions, 44% of those deaths are now in the neonatal period. So one of the challenges going forward will be how do we strengthen neonatal health? Are there vaccines we can give to mothers that will protect their mm -hmm. unborn children against infectious diseases and other complications, et cetera? Yeah, and you're also dealing with HPV. You're sort of getting into an area where you're starting to talk about a very different cohort of, of, of people to, to reach and to vac vaccinate, can, right? Yes, absolutely. And can I just say one other thing about middle-income countries? I think that's important. Um, the, you, you rightfully made the point, in, in when Gavi started, um, basically it was simple. 90% of poor people lived in poor countries with poor infrastructure and poor immunization coverage. And today we have uh, uh, you know, about 70% of, of, uh, of, of, of poor children living in middle income countries. And so one of the challenges is as countries graduate, we're going to have, as Robert has talked about, large pockets. So what do we do about that? How can we help? And there hasn't been a lot of interest in our development partners in saying, let's extend Gavi's subsidization of vaccines mm -hmm. to either more middle-income countries or to dealing with these large pockets. But are there other things we can do? And we're investigating right now um, whether we could use some of the work we're doing on market shaping to try to make uh, some of the pricing available to these countries over a longer period of time and have the growth in pricing as countries get wealthier, um, not go from, you know, a Gavi price to a big stepwise increase, which would make it unaffordable, but perhaps some slope with that. And, the, and our policy committee is going to be looking at some um, uh, potential policy interventions that might be done, not just for the Gavi graduating countries, but perhaps even for other um, lower middle income countries that haven't been Gavi eligible. And that might get you around the, the sort of a messy conversation you've been having with PAHO, right, around uh, whether or not they're going to be able to get the lowest prices, which traditionally have gone to, to Gavi. So it's a, it certainly seems a, a, an issue that's hitting you and, and Dr. Dybul and others leading these international institutions. We're going to turn uh, to you. Uh, for questions or guidance or advice uh, on how to make this case in the U.S. Um, I think, as Seth said, the U.S. has been a consistent supporter, but it's 8% or 9% at the Global Fund. Uh, it's right up at a third uh, and bumping up against that. Uh, a few months ago, we had the Global Fund replenishment, and it was like the, the hall of U.S. government stars. We had uh, President Obama. We had Secretary uh, Sebelius. We had Secretary Kerry. We had Susan Rice. Uh, it was really quite a cavalcade of, of stars. And so you've got Natasha on board, and that's certainly going to help. But, but how, do we, uh, how do we build the same kind of energy around Gabby? It's, in some ways, it's still surprising to me at least, that was such an easy case to make, with such a, an efficient delivery mechanism, uh, with the, uh, the idea of just saving babies. 
that we're still struggling to kind of generate the broad level of, of support you want. So we double, you see East is still low, right? So if we double some of these countries, triple them, we're still at li rates that are way lower than they are giving to a lot of other institutions. So maybe you can help us figure out what it is that they need to be doing a little bit differently to make this case. So we have microphones, uh, Alicia there, Dr. Kramer, soon to be <laughs> in the back. Why don't we take a couple questions and then we'll uh, let our panelists respond. Uh, thank you for an excellent um, uh, set of presentations. My name is Robert Steinglass. I work um, in charge of immunization at USAID's MCHIP projects, soon to be our MNCH project, and I'm also the um, uh, head of immunization at JSI. So um, my, my, I'm very, very pleased to see that the discussion is moving beyond access to vaccines. Uh, I know that in the draft business strategy, there's a lot of discussion about uh, having available services, strengthening routine immunization as part of the health system, making services more, um, <coughs> uh, not just available, but uh, people more aware and uh, the services acceptable and good quality, potent vaccines. These are all good, promising um, things in my opinion. Um, Catherine and Robert Clay both um, mentioned something I wanted to just follow up on. Uh, USAID, of course, is a technical agency as well as a, a major in financial investor. And uh, I wanted to um, find out, um, since they both mentioned country offices or missions of USAID, um, whether USAID itself needs anything from Gavi or from its partners in order to make that case better to influence the uh, country offices of USAID so that they do invest in the technical approaches that are needed to strengthen the routine immunization system. Again, commensurate with USAID's enormous financial contribution to Gavi in order also to protect that investment. Great, great question. Thank you, and uh, thank you very much for this panel. I'm Laura Shimp. I also work at, at JSI and John Snow Incorporated, but have been doing new vaccine and routine immunization um, technical support in Africa and India over the last 20 years. And prior to getting into public health, I studied international economics and African development. And one of the interesting things I'm finding over the last few years, particularly working in East Africa, is the needs in these countries for pretty much what Nicole was saying, financial advocacy skills building. Because in a lot of cases, the problem that they're facing is is being able to effectively argue with their governments, presidents, et cetera, an increasing proportion of the budget that needs to go to preventive health specifically for immunization, not only for the vaccine line item, but also then for the recurrent operational costs that have an additive component as they have more services going out to the public. So I guess my question for, for Seth or maybe for um, the Gates Foundation also is, is there a way that we can promote more institutional partnerships around financial advocacy to help these countries, either through extensions of the HSS window or potentially other windows, or building some sort of, of partnership, you know, alternative partnerships that will help uh, provide some of that financial literacy that's kind of needed with, with the countries to be able to, to be more effective in their uh, financing and accountability. Um, and with, with that then, how do we also provide the technical assistance necessary for that with you know, obvious caveats about transparency and governance and issues with political economy and that kind of thing? How do we do it in a way that's, that's considered to be non-biased really just for promoting the health of children and, and populations? Thanks. Great, so uh, two good questions and, and certainly uh, one of the challenges that both Gavi and Global Fund are facing is that their interlocutors at the government level are often ministers of health. Uh, and they're not the ones that necessarily manipulate the budgets uh, and do the supplantation that we talked about. So how do you make a case that not only works on a technical level with the people that need to, to do better around vaccines, but also with the financial and the political people who actually hold the purse strings? Uh, and, and are there things that we could do to help use the data you have to make that case better? And just to add on to that, in the U.S., you certainly you have to make, for many, a national security argument. So what is the national security argument for a Gavi investment uh, for a member of Congress uh, for whom that's a, a major priority? Well, I mean, uh, on, on that question, um, the first thing that's important is we need to have 
uh, ministers of finance in the conversation. So one of the reasons of having co-financing, even at the lowest level at the beginning, is to get that conversation, to get a line item negotiated. And so um, when Gavi was first started, for example, 68% of countries had a line item for, for, um, uh, uh, for immunization. Today, 90% do. It's not you know, totally there, but there's been a big increase, and that's important. And we do have a program in financial advocacy, the Sabin Foundation, the African Development Bank. We hope that the World Bank is going to take more of a role. It hasn't been in, as engaged in this in this last period as they could be, but to work with countries to have those discussions and to try to explain the importance of prevention um, as, a, as an investment. Because as you know, the problem with vaccines is they start off screaming you know if you when you bring a vaccine like the meningitis vaccine to the meningitis belt people are lined up for they come and all of a sudden you know the disease disappears it's a miracle it's amazing but over time when the disease is constantly gone people begin to forget about it what's the demand the demand is for treatment that's what always the demand is and so how do you keep that and by the way this is true in the u.s as well you know prevention doesn't get the attention it should it's always the stepchild so Having that type of education and engagement is absolutely critical to, to making this move forward, and it has to happen at all levels. It's something that we will try to do more of during this next period because the Minister of Finance, you were polite, is usually the lowest in the, in the, you know, this is seen as a cost to the Minister of Finance, not an investment for the country, not about increasing productivity or any of the other issues. That has to be changed as well. Yeah, I, I would, um I would say we could take a chapter from the Commission of Investing in Health, uh, and I know Seth, you were on that commission. Maybe you want to reflect a little bit on that. But here we have Larry Summers actually getting up in front of uh, ministers of finance at the World Bank, talking about how health is a solid, important investment um, for as an economic uh, strategy. And I think making sure that our communication vehicles or our spokespersons are those that are uh, respected, uh, listened to, goes a long way. I mean, the Minister of Health can talk all he wants, but we need to really empower those ministers of finance, get people that they listen to making the case. And I think Larry has done an incredible job in, in uh, promoting global health in, in the community. We've established an Office of Health Systems at USAID um, a couple of years ago. Uh, we have economists that are there. Those economists are working with our more technical oriented um, programs uh, such as MCH and <coughs> HIV AIDS and whatnot. And we're finding there's a lot of demand for people of using those skills to, to both better educate them but also to be thinking about things through that lens and looking at financial sustainability as well as other parts of sustainability. And if I may, just on Robert's question, um, I think, um, you know, what we've for this ending preventable child and maternal deaths, we've actually gone out to five countries in what we call a deep dive. We've actually gone to countries, really looked with the teams, is our portfolio aligned uh, with the interventions that are going to have the biggest impact to get us to the, the result that we want? And we're using um, you know, the best evidence that we have, and we're going through a very systematic process of, of aligning our portfolio uh, to achieve the results. I th and what we're finding is that over and over, immunization comes out right at top as of, of an intervention that would really achieve that result. And, and I think we have been a bit relaxed thinking that others were doing immunization, maybe it was UNICEF, maybe it was WHO, whatever. Uh, we've taken our eye off the ball. And I think that process for us internally has really elevated immunization as a, as the key, um, as a key priority for our, for our goals. So it's been based on evidence. So I think what Gavi can do is continue to generate solid evidence of the impact of, of these vaccines for our programs and how it saves lives. And I think using that um, and you know, tools like the LIST uh, model and others that can help project out where we're going with, with these uh, important vaccines is, is very helpful and it helps uh, change our, our portfolio. So. Can I just, I just on, the, on the commission report, which if you haven't read it, it's really interesting. Um, one of the key factors that they talked about, and they had some Nobel laureate uh, economists doing this, it's interesting to have them engaging with the health people, um, was that the way we measured health was wrong. We measured health purely on what did it do to productivity. But people value health themselves. They're willing to pay out of their pocket, and that's the way we measure in economics a lot of things, willingness to pay. 
And so if you look at the full value of health, which is productivity and willingness to pay numbers, it turns yeah. out that a full 20% of GDP growth during the last decade you know, has come from health investments. And it turns out the benefits are you know, even more dramatic than have originally been done. It was a good investment before without new measurements, but it's even better investment. And so it's important to kind of capture that in the argument that we're making. So I just actually want to agree with three comments and then add two. One is um, the Saban Institute actually has a sustainable immunization finance project that really looks at this type of country level advocacy. And it's promising, but something like that would need to be taken to scale. So there is something that exists, um, but we would need to see how that operates in different markets because each market is in fact unique. Um, the other piece that I agree with Todd as well as Seth is it is also about the ministers of finance in addition to health as well as other political leaders as within the system. And then obviously the evidence base is crucially important. The two pieces that I would add though is that when we think about the country level dialogue, um, it's not just Minister of Health, Minister of Finance. There are the bilateral or the country offices of the donors. And conversation among all of these parties just needs to be much more intentional and much more regular mm -hmm. because it's that kind of circular pressure and that kind of pressure from country mission to headquarters, um, whether it's a the sovereign government or whether it's a multilateral agency that can really help to just create that recirculating pressure and reinforcing that this is in fact um, a priority, which sometimes can be disconnected. Um, between um, off-site locations and headquarters. And then the last piece that I would say goes back to this broader advocacy. Advocacy by any market is going to be different and be unique. It is very different in the global south. There's just a difference in the weight that voice carries. But what I would say is that we have to be um, open to the fact that advocacy at country level may not be vaccine advocacy. It may not be immunization advocacy. It may be rights advocacy, it may be a broader child health frame. And so that means that multiple partners and multiple initiatives have to be open to promoting a broader agenda, understanding that there will be trickle down or there will be kind of, you know, times when their level's high, times when their level, when their um, agenda kind of rides the wave. But I think the, a combination of those things are the type of activities that will get us on the agenda at country level, which then again reinforces sustainability in the model that Gavi's doing so well at. And just to follow up, a quick question on that. Uh, both Seth and Robert mentioned the, the need to look for these larger federated countries at a subnational level. So do these same uh, conversations need to happen with governors and state ministers of health? Is, is this a, uh, how do you take uh, the conversation, and there's been some experience with polio in Nigeria, how do you move out of the capitals and into the, 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 the state capitals where the decisions are often even more important? I would just absolutely, absolutely yes. It, it gets very local and money trickles through systems in different ways and you have to figure out where money gets locked, where the decision points are and where you apply that pressure. Again, it's unique, it takes a lot of analysis, it takes a lot of evidence, but also um, recycling up what's working programmatically. Those stories are just brilliant and they don't always get told and they can have such impact. So I would encourage that as well. Great. Uh, just, just, I think this highlights the importance of global diplomacy mm -hmm. and I think for a long time health did their own work on their own side, but we didn't really take advantage of, of our, our diplomats uh, overseas. And so we have really focused a lot more on our ambassadors. And particularly in countries where, you know, some of our programs are 80% health now, 90% health in some countries, largely PEPFAR. But the ambassadors are engaging much more and they reach a whole different audience than, than the health community. So they're talking to, min to, to presidents, to prime ministers, ministers of finance, and having an ambassador really bring up these issues can, can, can actually add a lot of weight and credibility. They also travel, and they bring press with them. So they go out to states, they talk to, to governors, they talk to all kinds of people. And uh, again, they, they can be an important uh, uh, part of this equation. I think one of the challenges we have to keep in mind is that um, Gavi was the first of these large partnerships set up, followed by the Global Fund. And um, there was a, a great embracing of the light touch of these. You know, our overhead rate is 3%. Everybody loves that. Um, but we don't have anybody at country level. And I remember Richard Feacham the saying- The Global Fund plan was eight staff. Right, well, I, I, 14 <laughs> I was gonna say, <laughs> generously. But, um, and the reason I, I bring that up is that then you rely on your partners. That's the nice thing about the alliance. But when you say to WHO, who's a great partner on technical issues, 
you need to engage with the prime minister or you need to engage with the minister of finance. That's not their skill set. And so the challenge then is how do we do a better job in these countries? And this, I think, is going to be the challenge we're going to hit in some of these federated states. And we haven't yet worked through what that's going to look like. Um, I've just hired a new deputy at, at Gavi, Anya Radagupta, who has managed the largest public health program in the world in India. She will certainly have some thoughts on this, but you know, how do we work with different types of partners? How do we help support state-level activities? And as Nic Nicole has said, and the, the Gates Foundation uniquely has, you know, in Nigeria, you know, picked a state and is working in some others where they've really intensified their engagement in a state that's very important for polio, has very low immunization coverage. But again, for them, it's meant they've had to have a person in country almost continuously, different people and working in a different way. So we're all struggling a little bit with what does this look like, but it's clearly going to be a different model than originally envisioned with eight people in the Global Fund. Yeah. Catherine. Sure, I was just going to get back to this question about uh, the U.S. field presence and, and coordination with Gavi. And, and I think in my initial comments, I referred to the U.S. aid missions, but in the recommendations, you know, I also heard from people and, and wanted to just, you know, flag that where the, excuse me, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention have field epidemiology training programs. That's an opportunity for staff, um, you know, teaching in those and, you know, working with, with colleagues or, you know, just where there are other CDC personnel on the ground to also be aware of Gavi and the work that Gavi is doing and identify opportunities for collaboration. Um, similarly, where the Department of Defense overseas labs are working on vaccine related issues, um, whether, you know, through the Navy labs or through the Walter Reed um, initiatives, that, uh, similarly, these are also opportunities for collaboration. Yeah, and certainly within three miles of this uh, beautiful new building, there are a number of uh, uh, African ambassadors to the United States, and I would hazard to say that some of them probably talk to heads of state more than ministers of health. So maybe there's a way to actually talk to some of the people here to be able to make a case back home or to engage with Congress and make the case for Gavi in a way that's, that's uh, maybe more impactful than having some of the advocates do it. So more questions. We have a couple over here, and then uh, we have to, you guys have to ask some questions over here. Terry, I, I haven't heard from you yet, so you better speak up. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm, Paul Perl I'm Paul Perlman with the National Cancer Institute Center for Global Health. Um, I'm interested in some of the sustainability questions, particularly surrounding um, the middle income countries and the graduating countries. And one of the things where I think there's potentially an area to work is in, to, in technical capacity building, specifically in the development of vaccines and production of vaccines. Uh, an example that's sort of near and dear to my heart is, is the HPV vaccine. Um, when you look throughout the world, it's still, even with subsidies, too expensive. Uh, especially when you look uh, at India, for example. And one of the questions I have is, you know, the, the National Cancer Institute owns the rights to that vaccine. The, uh, it's, open, it's openly uh, able to be licensed. So what role can we play in getting some country ownership for regional production to get those prices down a bit? Thanks. There's one other hand up over here. Sorry. Thank you. I'm Tammy Holman from AllAfrica.com. Is there any evidence that intensive media coverage in African countries, Nigeria, for example, uh, has or could create public demand for political will for immunization. Um, and if not, if that evidence doesn't exist now, how would you design a test for whether that could become an important tool in your kit bag? So you mean the uh, advertising to build consumer demand for the vaccine as a way to build political energy? Coverage of the the importance of vaccines, uh, the payback of vaccines, both personally and economically. Great. Sorry, there's one other question right behind you. This side's being like quiet, I don't know why. <laughs> uh, hi, Peter Hale from the Foundation for Vaccine Research here in Washington. Um, first of all, good luck with your replenishment conference on May 20th in Brussels. I wish I could be there. We are fans of Gavi, and you do deserve increased support. Um, Seth, you said something, and Todd, you touched on it also. You, know, you asked the question, what more could we be doing in this country to generate enthusiasm, uh, you know, increase support from US, uh, US government? Um, and you did suggest that uh, your other groups, uh, you know, the, I mean, Gavi, we all agree, it's, it's kind of a best kept secret. Uh, other funds uh, out there have much higher awareness. So I do think that one of the things that you could do is just raise your visibility 
here in Washington. Uh, as you know, I spend most of my time on Capitol Hill. Uh, Garvey doesn't come up that often. Uh, nor, nor do vaccines. I mean, we've got, we, we, we've got a problem. So there's a generic problem creating enthusiasm around vaccines and all the exciting work that you're doing and that we're doing and so forth. But in the case of Garvey, I do think you could benefit from raising your own visibility here in Washington. And it's a PR challenge. I'm not sure how you do it, but other groups have done it. So I wish you luck. One more question over here. Um, Put your hand back up, yep, sorry. Uh, hello, my name is Alice Albunadra and I work for the Sabin Vaccine Institute Sustainable Immunization Financing Department. So I had two questions to Dr. Berkeley and also a comment to Nicole Bates. So my first question is, I know that Dr. Um, Berkeley mentioned that there's an interest to increase funding for, to improve vaccination coverage. And my question is for the subset of graduating countries is there also to evaluate the progress of financial sustainability? Is there any indicators that are evaluating management of funds and also management of the EPI program to ensure that coverage levels are being reached? Because maybe sometimes we think that more funding is equivalent to better performance, but maybe management also accompanies that. And another question that I had was, I know that Dr. Berkeley mentioned that ideally countries would be spending five to 6% of their national budgets on health, on EPI, right? So on, um, in a peripheral analysis of Gavi eligible countries, what we found is that that average is actually one to 2% currently, both graduating and those that are lower and lower middle income countries. And I do know that currently there is something called the comprehensive multi-year plan that Gavi uses to evaluate countries' five years plans on uh, so financial sustainability. So my question is, has there been any um, analysis on whether the government contributions within these CMYPs, comprehensive multi-year plans, are actually increasing at a faster rate than the donor and total budgets? Because what we found in a peripheral analysis was that actually government contributions are not increasing at a fast rate in comparison to the overall cost within these multi-year plans. And in addition to that, what is, is there an oversight of the data quality and are countries being motivated to collect and report accurate data on their financial funds um, that are allocated to the, to the immunization programs? So I know currently there's several forms of data being collected. Um, there's Gavi's annual progress reports, there's um, those that are within the CMYPs themselves, but also WHO and UNICEF's joint reporting form. And unfortunately, I think they're all quite discrepant. So is there any effort um, coming within Gavi to improve the monitoring and evaluation in country of their financial data? And finally, I apologize that was, for that. that. Was, can, can you uh, wind it up? Because that was four yeah, out of two. No, no, no. But that's, and now I have a comment for uh, Nicole Bates. So I know that you were mentioning the importance of maybe evaluating the funds or flow of funds in countries. So thus far, SIF has been able to conduct with in our countries something called the budget process. And so through the budget process, we're able to evaluate the flow of funds from what is being proposed to what's being actually executed. So we have successfully identified some bottlenecks while conducting this exercise. So. Thanks, so a couple of uh, good questions, comments. Do you wanna, um, Nicole, why don't you start off and we'll work our way this way. Sure, so I'll take these quickly. Um, First on uh, communications at country level. Um, intensive media, co media coverage is obviously very important as is interpersonal communication to generate demand. So UNICEF plays a really strong role of, of doing that at country level, but then there's also official formal media. That said, I think there are a couple things to keep in mind. Local language and local voices and local faces key as opposed to Western faces and Western voices and Western language. Um, if we really want buy-in and ultimate ownership and that's from the beginning to the end of the effort. Um, stories, again, are invaluable. Um, we have to articulate the impact. The one thing that I would say, and this is more from um, a polio lens, is that we need to be a little bit careful about um, the um, unintended consequences of a lot of coverage of something because sometimes there are extreme views or there could be bans on access that could be motivated if an issue is politicized. And so our media coverage could be incredibly helpful. We have to be thoughtful of whether it is 
could also be harmful. I think using those local voices can help to mitigate that risk, but it's just a calculation that needs to be made. But that voice is hugely, hugely valuable. Um, in terms of um, support and advocacy, you were talking about Gavi kind of being best kept secret on the Hill. There's actually a philosophical debate um, for a lot of issues. Do you need everyone to know or do you need the right people to know? Um, right? And so especially on the specific investment versus the broader agenda. And I don't have the answer to that. They're just different opinions on, on what that is and that kind of informs investments at time. But what I would say, and I see a couple of familiar faces in the room, we have the UN Foundation who runs an incredible uh, campaign called Shot at Life here in the US. They've partnered with Walgreens. They've partnered with um, Real Life Magazine. Just fantastic in terms of um, raising visibility and getting moms involved in blogging and local events and things like that. Powerful, powerful work that helps to mainstream this agenda. Results is incredibly powerful here in the US and the UK and Australia and Canada doing great work. PATH is another great partner where they actually help to bridge the evidence space and what's happening technically at country level with the political message. So you put those together, you start to generate the energy and the stories that can be shared um, politically or even publicly. Um, and then just a quick thank you for, for that comment on the, the budget analyses at country level. They're hugely important. Again, when those analyses are done, how are they translated and how are they shared so that people understand when you're having a political conversation, um, you guys may go on today, you may not talk about Gavi for the rest of the day. Policymakers certainly are not after they meet with us. And so we really need kind of those quick stories, that key information that gets people to remember us and to stick out as they consider a thousand other things on their agenda that others would say are equally important. Robert. Uh, just a quick comment on, on the visibility. Um, I think it's not just uh, vaccines in Gavi. I think in general, child survival had a heyday in the 1980s uh, with, with Gobi and Jim Grant, and it was really the talk of the town. Um, and I think with um, you know the Global Fund, with AIDS and malaria, that's kind of taken over the, the, the space. I think we're, with the call to action that we had two years ago, I think we started to readdress that. I think there's been a lot more focus now on child survival. We're having an anniversary event in June, and we're talking right now about how do we showcase uh, the role of, of uh, vaccines immunizations within that event. And, and it's, it's, it's reaching out to the Hill, it's reaching out to public, it's, it's a, it's a broad um, effort to really try to bring back the uh, sort of the awareness that we had in the 80s. And one, to show, you know, to tell the, the success story. It's an, you, you talk about Gavi being the best kept secret, but you know, what's happened with children overseas, um, child mortality reduction that Seth talked about, is an incredible story. And I think that message needs to get out much more into the general public to see what progress that we've had, and along with that, the role that vaccines has played. So um, let me go from the backwards and let me start with the, the uh, questions around um, management of funds and country, which is obviously a critical issue and it's a bigger issue. I mean, um, w many of the countries that, that um, have problems have problems because of management issues. And you know, Gavi is not gonna fi fix Nigeria's management system. Um, on the other hand, um, we can work with countries to try to build better systems and have them have better accountability, and that's absolutely critical to, to be able to make sure that um, you know, the programs go on, and particularly in the future. There is evidence that country spend is going up. One of the problems Gavi traditionally had been focused on new vaccines and hadn't been paying attention to overall. And so if we pushed co-financing, sometimes money came out and co-financed our vaccines, but it got taken out of the line item for routine vaccines, which is, doesn't do good for anybody. So we've now changed and we're looking at kind of the, the, the comprehensive immunization system. And that's absolutely critical, even if we were only interested in new vaccines, which we're not. And uh, Robert, when he um, originally talked, he's also the father of routine immunization. And one of the things that we're trying to move is this critical component that if you're doing special immunization activities, you're doing campaigns, they're not coming at the expense of routine, which traditionally it was. With polio, the more campaigns you do and you're paying people and you know there's, there's incentives for them to do that, they're not doing the routine immunizations and then you end up with very low coverage rate. That's not helping. We need to have you know, all of this linked and we need to at least make sure that when we do campaigns that they are certainly not hurting, ideally helping 
the routine coverage rate. So we've really changed in the way we're thinking about that. Data quality is critical. It's a priority. We're working on it. Uh, we're working on it with the IHP Plus. We're working on it with the World Bank, with the Global Fund, WHO. Um, but it's going to remain a problem. And, and uh, so we use surveys a lot. We do you know, lot sampling. Um, uh, certainly the Gates Foundation has worked hard around polio to build up better data systems. And now we're taking those systems and trying to use those for routine immunizations. Um, Visibility in DC, I agree with what uh, Nicole has said, but I do think we want more visibility and that's something we're working on. We recently hired um, a, an experienced uh, and talented star who will do more for us here in terms of engaging um, and I think that's an important part of, of what we have to do. Um, in terms of media, I agree, media is very important. We don't have a problem in our countries like we do here with the anti-vaccine groups. There are some, and I could go into more detail if you want, but in general, people see these diseases. They know about them. You know, their aunties have had kids die. They've seen people in their, in their neighborhood <coughs> die. And so when vaccines are available, they want them. The challenge is getting people educated, what's available, what they're for, what they do. And the media plays an important role with the caveats that, that Nicole talked about is getting the local face, the local language, and having people understand. And lastly, the question about local production. Um, you know, we, we have had some, some big successes in doing that. Recently, there was a, a, ro a rotavirus vaccine that was licensed um, from the NIH to an Indian company and went through uh, trials and, and uh, showed success in those trials, and that's rolling forward. Um, the challenge on vaccines is not just intellectual property, it's know-how. And that's the main thing that, that's critical. And what we're seeing now are some of the companies that have the know-how are working with companies in the South to do tech transfers. And as part of that, then, they're working in a new business model. And I will say that Gavi has changed the business model of vaccines. Most manufacturers were thinking, um, you know, uh, low volume, high cost vaccines, and they didn't know what to do with these countries. They, they care enormously, they're public health people, but there wasn't hard currency, they didn't know what the market, whether it was reliable, they couldn't build adequate size facilities to produce because they didn't know if they were going to be purchased. Gavi's changed all that. And now country, uh, companies are all thinking about the Gavi model and the Gavi countries as part of their planning process when they think about new vaccines. So that's the really good story. And as part of that, they're also forming these strategic partnerships with developing country manufacturers and to produce large amounts of vaccines for the rest of the world. And so, you know, we're in the middle of a change period. I do think that HPV vaccine will eventually have other manufacturers. I know that there are companies working on it. I know there are tech transfer operations going on. Um, and, you know, the challenge for some of these new vaccines are, though, that the prices aren't necessarily going to drop. These vaccines are not as simple as the measles vaccine or others. And so, yes, we're looking for in improvements in cost, but we have to keep in mind the value you're getting by immunizing children and keeping them healthy during their, li their lifetimes, not just the, the fact that we used to have vaccines that you could get six of them for under a dollar, and that's what people talk about. It's going to cost more, but the, the, the benefits are really enormous. So uh, we saw earlier this week some major changes in the vaccine market, two companies swapping uh, uh, some of their capacity. It's one of the things we're thinking about looking at here a little bit. Uh, there are a lot of questions. You have on your seats a little evaluation form. It's a half-page piece of paper. Uh, it would really help us a lot if you'd take a moment before we close to fill that out. Uh, include on there any future subjects in which you think we could be uh, focusing some of these kinds of conversations. That's enormously helpful to us. Uh, Seth, I'll give you the last word. You, you have to show up uh, in a few months uh, with an argument here and in many other capitals to make the case for uh, Gavi uh, financing. Uh, certainly you've articulated a track record of tremendous success. You've shown value for money. You've shown that uh, vaccines are best buy. You've got some of the best spokespeople in the world out on your behalf. Uh, what is it that you are really looking for in terms of getting financing? What, what's your ask gonna be? And are you, are you gonna get it or are you gonna actually have another London moment where you exceed it? <laughs> <laughs> It, it, a prediction is difficult, particularly if it's about <laughs> the, the future. future. Um, I actually think that um, we do have a good case. And the case isn't just about lives saved. It's about um, diseases prevented. It's about productivity. It's about children living up to their full IQ and being educated. 
The challenge is getting that message out and getting it out in different ways because it, it, this is a secret, but you know, I, I've not met anybody who is against saving children's lives and, and making them healthy. This is something that can sell, it can sell to, you know, on both sides of the aisle, it can sell in both houses. Um, I think the challenge is making sure that the message gets out there. And um, you know, the message is complicated because if you ask the average person about development age, you know, it's money that's poured in and it's wasted, it's not efficiently spent. It's not, well, this is an example, in fact, you know, we're lucky. We have data. We can show efficiencies. And, and so, in a sense, we're, we're blessed. The challenge is, is, is making that available. You asked, though, about uh, before about how you make this a, a, a strategic case. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to keep in mind, and, and, and we'll see this over and over again, until diseases are eradicated, you know, it is a global world now. You can have dinner in Nairobi, breakfast in, you know, in Europe, and lunch in in the United States, and that's within the incubation period of any of these diseases. And we see these diseases moving around like never before, which means we have to keep our immunization levels up here, but we also have to reduce the disease in the rest of the world, and so there is a strategic issue. Um, turns out that one of the largest outbreaks in the U.S., one of the most expensive outbreaks in the U.S., was a Swiss businessman going on a golfing vacation in Arizona. Now, you don't normally think of Swiss business people as being transmitters of disease, but the point is that you just can't predict. And so I think there's a strategic issue for the United States to try to eliminate these diseases, not just the United States, you know, and Saudi Arabia has the Hajj. They're immunizing against mm -hmm. diseases. The best way is not to immunize against the diseases, that's insurance, but get rid of the diseases to start with. And so the more we can talk about that, the miracle that vaccines bring, getting rid of these diseases, making people live to their full potential, the more we can sell this. And, and lastly, I do hope the U.S. continues to be a strong supporter. Um, they have been there from the beginning, as Robert has said. They've served on key committees on the board. We work together, and we, we hope that they will um, continue to play that role. Great. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, we're looking forward to your feedback on the forums. Uh, enjoy your day. I know a number of you are going off to Dr. Uh, Burks is swearing in, so congratulations okay. to Dr. Burks who has another important job. Good afternoon. <laughs>